United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose blood stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch was so gallantly streaming and the rockets were clear the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet The mission statement of the Osceola County School District is to inspire all learners to reach their highest potential as responsible, productive citizens. Good evening, I'm Ivoni Garcia, and I am here to provide interpretation services in Spanish. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Ivoni Garcia, y estoy aquí para proveer servicios de interpretación en español. Thank you. We are now asking positive comments. Um, Vice Chair Castillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll start with the event that you and I attended over at Pioneer Village, uh, which was a reveal of a bike rack that was designed by CNET students. I thought that was an amazing experience. Uh, um, Commissioner Grieve actually has this contest every year, and she has our students design um, is it always a structure? What is it? She has a theme usually. Yeah, she was, she was, you were the I, I judge. Yes, you were a judge. So, so this year they were designing a bike rack and it was really great to see those students kind of see their work come to life. So thank you for the invitation, um, Commissioner Grieve, and thank you for partnering with our schools. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Celebration K-8. They just raised $30,000 in their boost-a-thon. Uh, Mr. Whedon, the principal, had a really fun way to celebrate. Not sure if any of you saw it, but uh, he got uh, silly strings, if you will. So if you wanted to have a great laugh, you can go ahead and watch that. But it was for a great cause, so they raised a ton of money. So I just wanted to say congratulations to them. And that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Aguayo. Yeah, so I uh, had a really great time this past week. I took my kids to the blueberry picking at the Chapman Farm. I don't know if anybody's done that. It's kind of a staple. But I would absolutely go do that so that these kids can learn what it means to uh, take their food directly from the earth as opposed to just a grocery store. I had a conversation with a student and they were telling, they're a young student, but they were telling me that, well, if we can't get things from China anymore, then we'll just get it from somewhere else for free and we should have a free system. And it really uh, proved to me that they don't really have a, a relationship or an understanding of the relationship of what it takes to get food to the table. And so I thought that that was a, a great opportunity. I did it with my kids and it was a ton of fun. Um, I also wanted to thank the team, the finance team, Sarah, uh, the superintendent as well, but more Sarah than the superintendent even. Uh, today we had a workshop, and so I'm gonna kind of veer off of what I was planning on talking about, but today we had a workshop, and it was about finances. And for the first time since I've been elected, we actually had a stance which was sensible and responsible. For the first time since I was elected in 2020, I have never heard anybody be a proponent of doing something that seemed to be responsible and transparent. And we heard that today. 
And it just goes to show that we have been fighting for so long, the community has been fighting for so long for a change. And that change came, you know, it's coming. It's, you know, you'll see me sometimes, maybe I seem frustrated. They may not be happy at my pace or what I believe should be doing, but uh, I have so much, so much, it's a very joyful situation to see the evolution of this district into something that is more transparent, more honest, more responsible, better, smarter, faster, all the things that make us a better school system for the benefit of our community and your students. So I have to say thank you, Dr. Shanoff. Thank you to all of you on the leadership team who are stepping up to make true because three years ago, words like return on investment were voodoo here. And today it was mentioned over and over and over again and the commitment was made to do that. So. Thank you so much. And I have to thank the community because in large part, that has to do with the pressure from the community to make things right here. And uh, so your work has paid off. So thank you as well. Mr. Melendez. Thank you, I hope everyone enjoyed their spring break. And along those lines, we met with the gentleman named Mason Jones, who's leading the effort in the strategic plan because looking forward, you know, we make decisions all the time, you know, what's in front of us or putting out a fire. It's nice to kind of sit back and look at the big picture. And Mason was really fiery up and he got me going. And so just basic questions he asked, but just the way that he just kind of led it through. And I look forward to um, working with the rest of the board and, and really kind of looking at what, what do we want this district to be? And not just today or tomorrow, but five years from now. So I think that's important that we keep the eyes on the prize, so to speak, on what we want this district to be. One thing we do like and we do appreciate is the fact that we had our Education of the Year Awards. We had our Teacher of the Year. We also had a Support Staff of the Year. As a matter of fact, one of them back in the back, Don Parker, please stand up for a big hand. Right <laughs> she works at Toa High School, does an amazing job. Her husband's retiring soon, and but just you know, we really appreciate everything you do. Um, the Education Awards aren't just you know ceremonial. There's a vetting process, there's a committee that reviews the applications, and so a lot of work and effort goes into that. And so I just also want to thank Dana Schaefer and Community Relations and the folks behind the scenes because you see all the beautiful glitz and glamour, you don't realize all the logistics that goes behind the scenes because here I am trying to coordinate the SRO event. She's like, Mr. Melendez, you got to tell me ahead of time because we got to get all this moving. It's not just the idea, it's the fact that, you know, it's everyone to make it feel seamless because I've been to many events and not once I've ever heard about, man, things weren't done on time. Oh, the, the, the tables were mixed up. Now that I think about it, Dana, I really don't hear that. And so I really want to thank you and your staff for really making it seem so easy. You know, we enjoy it. We don't have to worry about the lights being turned on, the food not being ready. Well, if the food's not perfect, it's very much parts. Well, <laughs> but the point is, I can acknowledge that it takes a lot of work behind the scenes, and sometimes you don't always get that credit. It's always the teacher of the year support staff that gets all the limelight. I just want to let you know that I do appreciate the work that it takes to make it happen. And so, with that being said, we always appreciate the arts here, but I got a phenomenal guy coming up here. I got Mr. Johan Diaz and Mr. Long. Please come on up real quick from Gateway High School. If you want to come up here yep. too, Mr. Dr. Chano. This is an amazing student. Because that's all done. Nice. It's the first time I get to meet him in person. <laughs> so this guy is a superstar. I'm gonna get like a thousand votes just standing next to this guy. <laughs> you know, he has his own YouTube channel. He has his own Apple Play. He does like bachata music in like the Dominican Republic, but just brings it here locally. And so I know he does. Um, he was at the, the what festival. Was it recently that we had? Um, we had our um, international food festival that we had every year, Gateway to the World International Food Festival, and the kids were performing, and uh, Johan was there performing. Yes, and how many subscribers you got on your channel now? Over a thousand. He has over a thousand subscribers on his channel and Apple Play. How many downloads or anything like that? Or quite a lot. Most are on the same level. That's right. Woo! So look at this guy's already famous before we go. So I just want to let you know that the school districts, you know, we love academics and it means a lot to the district. We want people to reach the highest potential, but the highest potential is a holistic student. You know, we appreciate the arts, the academics, the athletics and everything else. And so with that, I just want to be able to recognize you, um, the superintendent as well, you know, or, and the rest of the board, really, just really a certificate of recognition. You know, the fact that you go above and beyond because, you know, a lot of times people just only do the school work and then go home and that's it. The fact that you're going out there and make it on your own and still keeping a high grade GPA, you know, it means a lot. And so, 
one day when you get big and famous, you know, don't forget us little people down here. So, all right? Okay. <laughs> he will not talk about himself. He's like the most polite, humble guy in the world. He's also ranked number one in senior class. He's in. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's in IB, the best college prep program in the world, shameless plug, um, but he's, 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 he's the whole package. He's a great young man. All right. You want anything to share with us? Or? <laughs> 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 he's, he's, he's humble to boot. So, are your parents here? You want to give him a shout out or anything like uh, that? My mom is back there. So is my sister. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you walk across the stage, brother. Again. You got to know another one over there. <laughs> that concludes my comments. Oh, wait, this isn't mine. I'm walking around. There's a pleasure. Dr. Shannon, can you talk to your comments? Yes. <coughs> um, it, it has been a month since we've had a board meeting, so we've had quite a bit happen. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting ceremony at um, Island Village, which was phenomenal. Um, so uh, that was great. I had the opportunity to join uh, three of our assistant principals, a uh, member of our HR team, and then also Dr. Reyes, who's um, on her way to uh, Singapore. Um, but got a chance to go with them over spring break on a recruiting trip to Puerto Rico. Uh, where we were searching for teachers. And it was my first time in Puerto Rico, but also my first time at a recruiting event for the school. An absolute joy to watch our assistant principals in action, um, interviewing and really being the face of our school district in front of so many really talented teachers Many of these teachers we extended contracts to, um, and, um, and some maybe were not ready to come to Osceola County yet, um, but they wanted to kind of initiate that conversation. It was, it was amazing. So I want to give a shout out to Diana Martinez in HR who um, put together the entire trip. Um, and I want to thank the, the assistant principals, Mark Hernandez, uh, Michele Morales, Yanni Vera, um, and, uh, and then Belinda Reyes, um, our assistant superintendent for elementary. It was great. Um, you know, I, uh, they didn't make fun of me in the way that I tried to order my food, um, in the way I asked for directions. Um, but um, They did in Spanish. They did. Yeah, they did. <laughs> So, uh, but it was a, it was an absolute uh, joy to be part of that experience, and I think that the public should feel very good about how proactive our human resources department, under the leadership of Dr. Green, um, how how serious they are about making sure that our classrooms are staffed um, for the fall. And it's a process that starts very early on. So um, it was it was a great, great week. And I just really appreciate um, all of them. So thank you. For my positive comment, I want to start by um, saying, sharing that I was out at Harmony Community School on Friday for a Leader in Me event that they had, where they showcased this amazing program that they have um, there that's been there since the creation of that school, I believe. Um, the students led it because they are the leaders of the school. So I had a fourth grader and a fifth grader leading my group, sharing all about how they learn to be leaders in their school um, and how they take what they learn in school and put it in other areas of their life at home, um, in their extracurriculars and things like that. And there's actually another one going to be taking place at Narcusi Elementary on April 11th. So I think my fellow board members received that invitation. If you're able to make it, I encourage you to go because it was a really great experience to um, get to witness that. 
I also visited Neo City yesterday to see phase two, the second building um, in construction right now. I joined a group of the um, engineering students, the juniors were able to go take a little field trip over to that building and um, see where it's at right now in the construction phase. They actually toured it in October, I think they stated, so they've got to see the progression from um, where it was in October to now, and I'm sure they'll get to see it again probably before it opens its doors to them um, for next school year. It's a really great uh, facility. They've got a lot of interesting concepts that take place in that building, and one of the things the students were most excited to see was the cafeteria, because they're finally going to have um, an actual cafeteria instead of eating from a food truck. So, um, but that, that was not on our tour, and they all asked about it, so we, we threw that in at the end. Um, in addition to that, I got to go home to my pandas at Pleasant Hill and do National Read Aloud Day with them a few weeks ago, and that was really fun. I got to go into um, one of our Teacher of the Year. She was the Teacher of the Year for that school, Melissa Hillen. She taught all three of my kids in first grade, so it was fun to get to be in there with her and read to her kids. Her kids were phenomenal. Those kids were like third graders, so they were very attentive, asked really good questions. Um, and uh, it was just a joy to be there. It's always fun to be back with students. Um, in addition to that, Dr. Shanoff and I actually participated in a um, round table last week also where we got to kind of uh, do something a little different. We joined along with the Charter School Alliance group and um, Dr. Eunice Casey of North Star Academies, which manages Main Street High, with, uh, and our topic was around student dropout and preventing student dropout. So it was a really good discussion that we had on how all of us are coming together for our students, whether it's a charter school, um, whether it's through virtual opportunities, whether it's in the public school, how are we making sure that our students cross the line um, at the end of their time here in our schools and go into um, you know society as productive citizens. So it was a really good conversation. If you want to see it, I think it probably is on their social media. Um, but it was really good, and it actually made me reach out to Main Street. I'm going to go take a tour of their school as well because they talked about some really great things, and I'd love to see it in action. And finally, we have this coming up later tonight, but I want to thank our school naming committee members. They'll be doing a presentation, I think, a little bit later uh, to present the school names that came up for the two new schools um, during their process. So we appreciate their time and their effort and their discussion spent around what those schools should be named so that our communities are being heard and um, everybody has kind of a say in what we're going to do with those two schools. With that, we are on to our presentations. We're going to start with student recognition for state honors. Dr. Chris Burns uh, and Joseph D'Ambrosi. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Happy Arts in Our Schools Month. Happy Arts in Our Schools Month! Don't sound so excited. Come on! Yeah, That's the arts. That's the best part of the meeting, remember? So we had some amazing representation at the state level from all of our disciplines, and we're not going to go through every bit of these uh, 13 pages of names. We'll just do the highlights, so about 10 pages of names. Uh, I'm going to start with the Allstate Ensembles for Orchestra, which we had representation from Celebration High School, as well as AXA. Both had multiple students in the orchestra at the state level. And then in band, we had representation from Celebration High School, St. Cloud High School, AXA, Gateway High School for the Concert High School Band. Popular Music Collective, which is a brand new ensemble that started a few years ago. Florida was the first state to have one. We had representation of two students in that, so that was incredible. Symphonic Band had representation from Celebration High School, Harmony High School, and AXA. More pages. And then on to Chorus. We had representation in the high school chorus from Gateway High School, Toho, St. Cloud, AXA. And then at the Senior High School, Soprano and Alto Chorus, Celebration High School, AXA, St. Cloud, Tobacaliga. Then the tenor chorus, this is where Osceola County really shined. Our boys this year, just in Come on, so tenors. many of them, right? <laughs> Celebration High School, Harmony High School, Oxa, Poinciana High School, St. Cloud High School, Topa Caliga. And then on to middle school band, we had Oxa Celebration K-8 had representation in the jazz band. We had two Oxa students in that. The middle school mixed chorus, we had students from Oxa and St. Cloud Middle School. Then the treble chorus, we had, once again, uh, Celebration K-8, Discovery, Oxa, St. Cloud Middle School, 
And then on to our theater. Yeah, that's not all. Actually, before we do theater, our uh, elementary, yes. <laughs> even elementary students are able to compete to perform at the state level. And we had three of our elementary schoolers, all three from St. Cloud Elementary School, under the direction of Miss Kim Molino, who was a top 10 finalist for Teacher of the Year. So incredible things happening at all levels in music. So, moving on to theater, which is my background, so I'm a little bit biased, but we had lots of representation and, might I add, lots of wins at the State Thespian Festival. If you don't know what thespians are, thespians is sort of like the mecca of high school theater. It's um, all the theater nerds of the whole state in one place. Some it's people, a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot of tears, a lot of emotions. All right, so starting with OXA. OXA's middle school won the following. Best in show, which it sounds, it sounds what, like what it is, the best of the entire state in solo acting, in ensemble acting, in solo musical, and in best one act. They were actually able to bring their entire show that they performed at the OPAC at OXA and perform it in Tampa at the State Festival. Uh, they also had top honors in solo musical, duet acting, uh, solo acting, pantomime, and I already said duet acting. The high school level at OXA also cleaned up. They had best in show solo acting, duet acting, best in show solo musical, best in show choreography, and those are student choreographers, uh, alternate best in show for ensemble acting, and best in show for duet musical. But that's not all, because Tohopa Kaliga also had lots of representation and lots of wins, including best in show large group musical, uh, small group musical, two students won best in show for monologues, and this is where it gets kind of cool. I mean, it always, it's all kind of cool. Uh, but our, one of our students won best in show for theater marketing. So if you are concerned that your child wants to enter a career in the arts, the arts are lucrative because you can go to school for marketing and still get a job in the arts. Anyway, uh, best in show for playwriting and best in show and second runner up for makeup design. So lots of great things. Oh wait, there's another page. St. Cloud Middle School also took home best in show for solo musical theater, so, uh, duet acting, uh, costume design, and small group musical theater. Okay. Back well, to wait, you. There's more. Back to you, Chris. <laughs> for dance. We have something called the Florida Dance Performance Assessments, which two of our schools participated in. We had OXA and St. Cloud High School go and perform their amazing shows. And I was able to attend. Both shows were incredible. And we had many students at that get accepted into intensives at places such as Joffrey's, which is a really cool experience for our students. And they also get to talk to colleges and work on their interview skills. And sometimes you get accepted to a college on the spot, which has happened with a couple kids. So very excited about dance as well. Art happens in the spring, so that hasn't really happened yet. We'll come back. Visual we'll, art, we'll have all another, their competitions are happening right now. We'll have another arts moment of uh, something. We'll make two arts months. Yes. It'll be great. Now, we wanted all of these students who were under these umbrellas to be recognized tonight. We do have a couple of art students around that participate in all different kinds of disciplines across the state. Give us a wave if you are one of those students. A big wave, Carlin. Oh, sorry. Very well. Good, very good. But there is a reason why those students aren't here tonight, and it's because, well, they're still working. They're still at school right now, rehearsing for their musicals, for their concerts, for upcoming things. Our kids work so hard in the arts, and we are so proud of them. And it's all culminating here in what we, in all of this data that we've collected on how well our students are doing statewide. Great. Thank you. Oh, that's right. Proclamation. I would like to call up to the podium Miss Carlin Del Moral, who is a senior at St. Cloud High School and is a one of our incredible dancers. She is going to present the Arts in Our Schools Month Proclamation. She's also a participant in our upcoming Arts Alive Scholarship Showcase, happening next Friday night. <laughs> Good evening. Um, you heard the introduction. I'm Carla Morale. I'm a senior. I go to St. Claude High School. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get started. Okay. Um, whereas 
the School Board of Osceola County, Florida recognizes the art defined as dance, music, theater, and visual arts as an important element of a complete and balanced education. And, whereas, learning in through the arts enables students to develop critical thinking and problem-solving skills, imagination, and creativity, discipline, and alternate ways to communicate and express feelings and ideas and cross-cultural understanding, which supports the academic success across the curriculum as well as personal growth outside the classroom. And whereas imagination and creativity are increasingly understood as critical <coughs> capacities needed for success in the 21st century workforce. And whereas Recent Florida Department of Education data of all 12th grade students vetted by multiple major university resources conclusively show the more art classes taken, the higher the student's achievement in all measures including graduation rate, GPA, FSA, and the SAT, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic status. And whereas the arts can transform our schools into havens of creativity and exploration, places where students want to learn, teachers want to teach, and all <coughs> members of the learning community are more engaged and motivated. And whereas, high quality school-based arts education involves a wide range of partners, including educators, parents, artists, and arts organizations, community members, and local and statewide organizations. And whereas, we applaud the efforts and dedication of arts educators and advocates around the state, and call for school and community leaders to continue to broaden and strengthen their efforts to provide arts education for every student in every school every year. Now therefore, the School Board of Osceola County, Florida hereby proclaims this month of March 2024 as Arts Education Month. And we urge all citizens to join in recognizing the special contributions that arts make in the lives of the children of Florida. Thank you. Second. Second. Um, motion by uh, Vice Chair Castillo, seconded by Mr. Arguello. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And that leads us to one more arts, our fine arts moment, which is the sax quartet from Celebration High.
this evening is for Matthew Fenn to be the next assistant principal of Celebration High School. Matthew Fenn has held the following positions, MTSS coach, interventionist, learning resource specialist at Parkway Middle, MTSS coach, learning resource specialist, interventionist, interim math coach at Toho, dean of students at Toho, MTSS coach, grad coach, PLC coordinator at Toho. He received his bachelor's degree in photography, film, and video from the University of Illinois at Chicago, a graduate certificate in art education from the University of Central Florida, a master's degree in teacher leadership in curriculum and instruction from the University of Central Florida, and a master's degree in education leadership from American College of Education. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Vice Chair Castillo, a second by Mr. Arguello. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you all very much. Uh, just a few short words. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today and experience this with you all. Uh, I come from a long line of educators. And I can think of nothing better, no better way to honor their legacy than to stand before you today. As a young child, I remember watching and admiration in the back of my mind thinking someday I'm going to do that. And uh, to see that early childhood conviction unfolding in my life continues to be a great source of joy. The school board and Dr. Shanoff, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I'm both humbled and grateful for the opportunity to serve the students and community of Celebration High School. As a man of faith, I do not believe the path that I'm on is happenstance. Uh, being an educator is truly a calling. I choose to listen and I've walked this path by faith ever since. I hope to continue to be a good and faithful servant wherever the path may lead. Uh, I've worn many hats as an educator. Uh, Dr. Shannon quite eloquently kind of shared a lot of those. Uh, each role has been a, a unique opportunity for growth and a chance to improve my craft. I am so grateful for all the paths I've crossed in this role. And of all those hats I've worn, coaching cross country track has been the greatest privilege. I'm so grateful for all the paths I've crossed in this role and all the amazing memories. Moving forward, I wish my Tiger Nation the best of luck with the rest of their track season, and I look forward to supporting the Storm Nation in all of their athletic endeavors. Uh, in closing, no one accomplishes their goals alone. It takes a team. I would like to take a moment to thank some of the important and influential people in my life. First and foremost, to my wife, Yvette, and my son, Troy. You're my rock. I love you. <clears throat> to my, my amazing parents and siblings, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the love you have poured into me. To Dr. Allen, Dr. Clay, and Dr. Evans, and Ms. Ray, thank you for the acknowledging my hard work and providing me this opportunity. Uh, to Mr. R. Scott and the rest of the admin team and Toho family, uh, thanks for believing in me and uh, acknowledging and uh, giving me the opportunity to grow. Uh, to Mr. Todd, my new Storm team, I'm flattered and honored. Thank you. Lastly, to all my colleagues along the way, I'm so grateful for the experiences we have shared. Thank you all very much. Uh, before I announce the next um, appointment for your consideration, I want to take a moment and, um, <clears throat> and thank uh, Ed Parker, uh, who has dutifully served as our director of um, purchasing and warehouse services for many, many years. Um, Mr. Parker is embarking on something that we all aspire to, retirement. <laughs> um, and it's a well-deserved retirement. Thank you for your years of service. Uh, you have always been the consummate professional and, um, and our district has benefited as a result of your hard work and your diligence. So thank you for everything. 
Thank you. And on that note, I would like to um, I would like to introduce uh, Christine Rodriguez um, as the uh, new director of purchasing and warehouse for your consideration. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to read the back. Yeah. Christine Rodriguez has held the following positions. Manager of Purchasing Services for the School Board of Brevard County. Director of Procurement and Contracting for Orange County Public Schools, where she undoubtedly cleaned up a bunch of my mistakes. <laughs> Assistant Procurement Services Director for Osceola County Board of Commissioners and Director of Procurement and Distribution Services for the School Board of Brevard County. She received her bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Central Florida and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Florida. She currently holds the following certifications, certified professional public buyer, certified public procurement officer, NIGP certified procurement professional, and certified professional in supply management. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Melendez, a second by Mr. Arguello. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes, congratulations. Thank you. 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 Thank you
if you go through the contract, there's there's many of them, right? And there's many of them which I would like to pull, but I'm only focusing on the renewals. So the ones that are being awarded this evening, okay, fine. Um, I'm not gonna uh, contest, but for 906, 907, 908, 909, these are renewals. They're not entitled to the renewal, but certainly we can do a better job of finding the local people to participate in these programs. As I'm just doing quick Google searches, I could find local Osceola companies that provide these services. So they haven't been pulled into the stream. So I'm not gonna contest the ones that are initial contracts that are bid that nobody bid on but these were ones that were not bid on at that time because we didn't have the programs that we do now so if we extend it now we're robbing an opportunity of members of our own business community here in osceola county from participating so i would request that we deny these extensions we put it out to bid and we allow these local companies to come and we're contributing back to our company and providing with opportunities especially in the economic times that we have right now. Thank you. Um, those are the exact same concerns I had as well, because when you look at the renewal types too, um, gym floor maintenance, printing of signs, you know, miscellaneous parts for kitchen equipment, that's the perfect opportunity for a small business to actually do work for the school board. They're not multi-million dollar contracts that they can't afford to have due to insurance reasons or bonding purposes. This is the perfect avenue for our small business department, which is led by Katrina, to be able to look at those folks and say, come and get these contracts or at least bid on them because we can't guarantee any contracts to anyone. We just want to give them the opportunity to get the work. And if they don't come in at the best price, then they don't win. But we have to at least give them an opportunity to get that, get that shot. So, um, but I'm willing to compromise, since these are all just one year renewals, if we can condition the approval based on the fact that Katrina's office will actively recruit and outreach to people, because these are just one year renewals. Now they have the opportunity, because the other issue is a big company will have a full-time procurement department, and they'll create these wonderful bid packages and make these wonderful presentations to win these contracts. Some of these small businesses are a little bit smaller. You know, they can't just, in two weeks notice, create this wonderful bid package. They need some time to be able to get together a proper estimate, look at what's in the marketplace, and create a nice proposal that's winning. So um, I'm willing to say I'm gonna approve these one-year extensions, but based on the fact that we created a department of small business led by Katrina to go out there and actively recruit people to try to get more participation and more bids on the time for the expiration. So Are you making but, a motion? Um, well, I just want your opinion first before I make that motion. I'm fine with it. Mr. Aguayo, you're being. Yeah, um, the problem. Sorry, hold on. Mr. Melendez, were you done with that? Yeah, I'm done with that. I just want, before I make the full motion, I just wanted to get consensus on the board first. Mr. Aguayo? So I wouldn't, I, I, I would not be agreeable to that because basically they're losing here. In fact, if you look at 90, um, 908, I've had that contract in the past with the school district. So, um, that school district, which is for signs and all that, there's plenty of Osceola companies there, but there's also companies that are outside of Osceola. Okay, fine, that's, that's one, that one's okay. But these are not complicated to get. They're complicated, they're overwhelming in the sense that you are applying in a public procurement process, so they can be overwhelming when you look at them, but they're not hard. I'm sure that Katrina can get these companies. Some of these, 908, no big deal, okay? There's a lot of companies in there. Certainly 906, 907, um, 909, these are all ones that we should not extend. We should allow them to bid. It's a year. If, they, if it goes out to procurement, they would have three months to take a 24-hour, it may take like 24 hours to get this ready to submit your proposal. And what we would be doing is basically allowing our local businesses to earn millions of dollars with the school district. So we should absolutely um, allow them to do that. To say no now and later, I mean, we're, we're repeating the harm that we caused three years ago by not having these. So I'm not saying, again, the ones that are awarded initially, fine. Those, I, to, in my opinion, they fall under the same situations. Why are we sending work to Jacksonville, Huntington, Tampa, Suwanee, uh, in Georgia, Vernon Hills, Illinois, Tampa, all these places when we should be giving it right here at home. So we would be, again, 
the economy is bad right now. What we should be doing is helping these companies right now, not in a year from now. It, it's, it's, it would be beneficial for these small companies um, today. So, I mean, it's, it's, and you can't put, we could say, oh, well, we're gonna do it under the, with the understanding that we're gonna allow them to, or we're gonna ask that Katrina to go and find them. But why not put it out to bid right now and allow her to find them now and they can participate right now? I just one follow up on Yeah, for 906 through 909, which are the renewals, um, what are the expiration dates on those? Because I remember before we had uh, discussions with the board, we don't want these to expire like the next day after they come to the phase. You know, what are the expiration dates on each one of those? 906 to 909. So 906, it looks like it's May 18th. They're in the letters. Um, 907 is August 16th. August 2nd and 909 is September 7th. Okay, so I'm willing to um, approve 906 because it's May 8th, but then um, to Mr. Arboyo's point, since you got August and September, we have plenty of time to, um, to do that. So I'll motion to approve 906. Second. I have a motion to approve 906 with, by Mr. Melendez with a second from Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion passes 3 1. We are on to 907. Mr. Melendez. Oh, no, no, that was the same, it was the same argument. I'm not going to make this well, no, no. I mean, we have only had a motion for 906. We have 907, 908, 909 called, so we have to do those individually at this okay. point. Uh, um, well, well, I don't, well, I support, I guess, TPing it to allow our group. I don't know how to explain it. The point is I don't support it. Well, neither there a mo we will need some sort of motion on 907. We don't need to make a motion. It will die if someone else does not make a motion as well. I ask um, attorney if we make a motion and it's 2-2 two -two, does this mean that this cannot come back in the manner that Mr. Melendez is asking for it to come back it actually yes it would okay it would constitute a no I make a motion to a table item 9.07 so that these can go back out to bid. Second. I have a motion and I have a second, but I have discussion. Mr. Perkwell, you are recognized? Yeah, I would ask that the school board member, Castillo, retract her motion. I will make a motion to put this back out to bid. That's what I just That's said. Just okay, so I, okay. That's fine. Sorry about that then. You're TPing it though, right? We don't need to table it. Okay. Right? We don't need to table it. We can just vote right now to put this out the bid. Are you asking Ms. Castillo? Um, no, asking I'm asking me? Madam Attorney. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, if you table this, then you could put it back out to bid, or if you write it down, you can also put it out to bid. Right. What you can't do is bring it back. If you vote on it and it's a 2-2 two -two or it's a no, which would be a 2-2, two -two, you can't bring it back exactly like it is but you can then put it back out to bid and bring it back after that. So it's either. So TP and it would do the exact same thing. Is that correct? But we're delaying it and it's. That is correct. Whether you table it or you vote no on it, it has the same effect. But if we TP it, we delay it for two weeks because it's supposed to come back, right? If you, yeah, you can. Or, you, or you're suspending it. So you're suspending it in air. There's no purpose to it when we can just right now resolve it. That was my point. Do you just want to make the motion yourself? I'll second you. Go ahead. Make okay, the motion. So I'd like to make the motion to put this back out to bid. Second. We have a motion to put 9.07 back out to bid by Mr. Rigoy. second by Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes 9.08. Motion to take 9.8 out to bid. I have a question on 9.08. Um, this one does have a considerable amount of local vendors. You still have an issue oh, with okay. it. This has one, two, three, the okay. majority. Okay, uh, motion approved. Second. 
We have a motion to approve 9.08 as submitted a second by Mr. Melendez, a second by Vice Chair Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 9.09. Motion to send it out to Second. We have a motion to send 9.09 back up to bid by Mr. Melendez, a second by Mr. Arguello. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? We are down to 9.21. Is this the dental? This is the dental. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this one, I had some, some issues with it because I'm not getting all the information or it's not really clear. <clears throat> From my understanding is there's two people that, or there's two entities that were sent for oral presentations, but I understand that there's only three people that had submitted. And so, you know, what was the justification for just getting rid of one company? You know, I can understand that if you're shortlisting from 10 or 15 people, you don't want to have, you know, you know, 20 oral presentations. You have to try to have some kind of, you know, system to narrow it down. And here it was just kind of narrowed down. And then, and on top of that, you look at the score sheet itself. I had printed out here. Um, for instance, you have um, like MetLife, for instance. I'm just using them as an example. You have um, a category called relevant experience. The experience of respondent with Florida school boards. That's a very you know, clear cut, you know, kind of question. It's not really, you know, object, you know, subject to discretion too much. And yet you have evaluator, evaluator number one gave him a score of four, and evaluator number four gave him a score of a two. So, and this is, I believe, out of four, or no, out of five, so two out of five. So basically, one person didn't think they had experience, and the other person did. So to me, that doesn't sound very fair in the way that they're scoring these, these sheets here, because um, relevant experience should be very black and white. It's either you do have experience or you don't have experience. There shouldn't be a lot of variance. But when you look at the first question, the ability, capacity of the proposer, you know what? I think that has a lot of variance because that's very subjective. You know, maybe I think Mr. Parker has a lot of um, capacity. Maybe this one doesn't. But to sit there and say relevant experience has a song, has a strong variance of like one person scoring a four, one person scoring a two. So I have questions over the um, the integrity of the score sheet itself and and the process because when you only have three people submitting bids and, and all three of them are qualified folks and then we only have two interviews and then out of the two interviews the score sheets are are not really the most um, clear cut thing and and, and, the, and the final part of that is another example is the fee schedule you know the fee schedule it's either expensive or it's not expensive and evaluator number one put a four and evaluator number two put a two and so we even have variance on the way the score sheets are so i just can't in good conscience um say yes to vote to somebody when um i'm not really clear on the scoring process and things like that I'd like to defer part before me to either the superintendent or Sarah. Is there an issue with this one? I, mean, um, I do not believe there's an issue with, with this one. I do understand Mr. Melendez's concerns, and we can talk further about process. Um, but the committee did go through the shortlisting. There were three original submittals. Um, my understanding is that the way they went, they decided to bring in two versus all three, was the third one had a much higher fee. Um, so they went ahead and said rather than bringing all three in for oral presentations, they would just bring these two in for oral presentations. So that is the natural shortlisting process, the way it's designed. Which is the missing company? Um, was, it, was it Delta Dental? I think is what Lauren said. Sorry. Uh, wait, I can get that information. Okay. No, um, I mean, I'll, sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, I, I'm a, we, we've had issues that are far worse than this one, which we've approved. I don't see that there's an issue here, so I'm ready to. I'll motion to approve. Second. 9.21. We have a motion by Mr. Arguello, a second by Vice Chair Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Motion passes 3-1. So we are on to um, Mr. Melendez. You've had 1101. This 
Ross's informational item? Yeah, the audit committee findings. Yes, when, um, because we have this Castillo that's there, and so um, part of what we wanted to do as a board was to give us information about what was discovered at each one of our, our subcommittees. And um, there was a couple items, a couple findings that I found you know, interesting that I would like for the rest of the board to share. Uh, like for instance, there was school internal accounts audit, and there were 27 schools that had no findings, no problem. But we had one school that had five plus findings. You know, two schools had four findings, two schools had three findings. So there was a significant amount of, and the thing is, the auditors here go, the most common finding was a deficiency. But I don't know what the definition of deficiency is. I mean, it's not very specific. So I was wondering, Ms. Castillo, if you were there, could they describe what some of those findings were? Because they just use the word deficiency, but, you know, or Sarah, do you know? Um, this was December of last year? Like a much lower level than a finding. It's just really just a, a, an observation. Um, we, I will send you guys the detailed findings though of, of, of all of the individual schools. I believe what you're looking at it was a summary. Um, so I will send you the, the detail by school along with each school is required to respond to each one of their findings. So I will get all of that to the board. Um, this is pretty consistent with what, what we expect to see. The fact that there are no overarching comments in the district-wide public report is a good thing. That means that not, while, a, while a school here or there may have had four or five findings, um, there was no pervasive um, audit finding that you know a third or a half of our schools were experiencing. Right. And then I guess the other question related to that topic was, was each finding something completely different or is there a common thread or is there, there a common there finding common that threads. occurs at all schools so that way we can try to do like professional development and, and let folks know yes and we do that annually in our bookkeeper training we actually have the auditors come in and address all of the common audit issues okay and then the other item was they also did um findings with our third party um i think tpa i always get all, i got ten thousand acronyms in my head i forgot what a is third party administrator or yeah, it does claims on evolutions. And so we have spoke about it during board meetings on board member prep here. Um, there are some overpayments and underpayments, but they weren't that significant. But the big issue was the pricing of the claims themselves. The auditor quote wrote, the claims data feed provided by evolutions contained you know, erroneous data, which rendered our testing results invalid. We worked with evolutions to correct the issue, but it was unable to resolve the discrepancies. Therefore, we are unable to test the pricing of claims by the TPA. So Evolution's data was so bad that they weren't even able to do a, 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 a legitimate audit to come up with results. And so um, I don't. I think at the time we had spoken with the attorney. Do we have? Do we have like a right to audit issue? Because now we have to do a deeper dive. Does that make sense? Like, I don't mind spending money initially because we want to find something, but the data was so bad, we couldn't even make a conclusion. So now we have to pay somebody again to do a deeper dive to correct our data, and I don't think that's fair for the school district to have to pay out of our pocket just to do a basic audit. And I just think that, um, well, I don't know if Sarah can, if she's allowed to comment on what the right to audit contract says. So we would need to review the contract to see if there is a term in there where we do have a right to audit or not and what that would be if we are able to do that and charge them or if it's something that we would need to do on our own. I do know in my discussions with the finance department that they've been working very diligently on this matter to make sure that it's addressed. We, we, are, we are going to audit it. We need to check to see. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to charge the company for it or not. But at this point in time, we haven't identified that there's definitely a specific issue that we're accusing them of. We just know that we need to look deeper. They have provided, um, in their opinion, they have provided the requested data. That's, um, so we need to dig deeper. We are working with our consultant on this, what the scope of this audit needs to look like, and they were notified today that we will be moving forward with an audit. Yeah, so the, uh, just for clarity purposes, um, so it's not the fact that I think we found something, it's the fact that we couldn't even conduct the test. So uh, well, I guess, do we put down a limit on how much we want to spend to conduct an audit just to make sure it's faithful or? 
if the board would like to provide direction on that, you can, or I can bring a proposed, it, it will be under $50,000, so I wouldn't typically bring that proposed scope back to the board. Um, right, so in other words, you're okay with us just doing like a random sample, less than $50,000. If something is found, then we would have to have another discussion with the board to sit there if you want to do a deeper dive. If we're going to spend over $50,000, which is not what we're anticipating to do this work. We are on to 12.03. Motion to approve. 12.03. I have a motion by Ms. Castillo. I have a second. Oh, second, second, second. Sorry, second. we're jumping around. Second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes 13.01. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve 13.01 by Ms. Castillo, second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. 14.01. Motion to approve 14.01. Second, second. I have a motion by Ms. Castillo, second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes 14.02. Motion approved. Second. Motion by Mr. Melendez, second by Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes, 14.03. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ms. Castillo, second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes, 14.04. Motion Second. Motion by Mr. Melendez, second by Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes, 14.05. Motion. Second. Motion by Ms. Castillo, second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes, 14.06. Motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Castillo. Second. Second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes, 14.07. Motion approved. Motion second. by Mr. Melendez, second by Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Motion passes, 14.08. Motion, to motion by Mr. Arguello, second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes 14.09. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Arguello, second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Motion, uh, aye. <laughs> motion passes. Any, of, any opposed? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> motion passes 14.09. Is that where we're at? No. 10. 10. 10. 14. <laughs> Um, motion. motion by Ms. Castillo, second. second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. 14.11 um, and 14.12 were pulled by Mr. Arguello. We also have, I think, representation here from the committee. How do we go forward with this if you want to discuss? <laughs> Did you want to allow them to speak first, or did you That's want to speak Do we allow you them? can allow them to speak yeah. first, make the presentation. I, I think we have someone from the committee here. No. Yeah, we have no. several people from the committee. Candace? Is this BB or CC? Uh, BB is first. Um, actually, our um, elected chair of our committee was unable to be here tonight, so I'm just stepping up to present. Bear with me, I didn't have any time to prepare. Um, my name is Amanda Gallagher. Um, as a community member and parent, I was honored to be included in this discussion, um, and I'd like to thank the rest of my, commu my community members who talked with us as well. Um, as part of the process, we considered input from the community, which strongly favored the name Knightsbridge. However, as we looked over the naming bylaws, it states that a school cannot be named after a single housing community, and Knightsbridge is the name of the community directly next to the school. So based on that, we continued our discussion, and um, after talking through several options, we voted to submit the name Knights Point for the new K-8 school BB at Knightsbridge. Um, we chose that name as it retained a sense of the informal name that had already been given to it by the community and they seem to have already accepted that name so figure keep it as close as possible any question yeah. we uh, mr um, is like recognized mr Aguirre? well if he's got a question he can ask a question okay mr <laughs> go for it 
Well, thank you for volunteering, number one. Yes. Yeah, we appreciate it. I know you're busy, and so we appreciate you doing that effort. Um, and I know we're just naming the name now, but I also noticed that we also asked you guys some colors. And so I was just curious, is there any idea? Did you guys come to any consensus on we kept our discussion pretty much on the name. Um, however, we did talk about the mascot as the road leading to the school is called Golden Knights Lane, Golden Knights Circle, something along those lines. So we did agree that if we had any input on the mascot, Golden Knight would be what we would recommend. All right. Awesome. That's it. Just to clarify, Mr. Melinda, is that the purpose of the committee just so? Yes. There was only for the name of the school. So they were not charged with the colors or the mascot. Yeah, but on the, on the agenda packet, it shows a survey and they were asked questions. So I was just Absolutely. Sure. And they did consider that. The survey was um, an informal one done via social media for the community at large, not for our individual committee. So that's the information that we use to help us decide where to go. Awesome. Thank you. Mr. Rick <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> So first of all, let me thank you as well. Thank you and the other committee also. I was making I was making calls, I was shooting emails to all the members that I could to try to get people to participate in this program. I did not like the process and um, and it's not for you specifically. Right. So you're 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 good, you're cool. You can um, I mean you can excuse her. You you would excuse her actually. You can have a seat. Thank so, you. Thank you for your time. Um, and they did have a great discussion on both committees. I was here, I sat here, I didn't say a word, I just observed. And um, so here are my observations. Number one, it was completely rushed. This is a conversation that is extremely difficult to have in one hour when you have a meeting coming right after you to tell you to get out, right? So it's totally unfair to ask these people that you have, they walk in the door, they get seated, and now you have 58 minutes left to introduce yourselves, have a conversation, get your instructions, and you have to decide the name of something as important as a school for a community for the next 100 years, right? That is unfair. It's, it's a terrible charge to have. And they were not provided with instructions that I believe were appropriate and fulfilled, like uh, full, right? It wasn't like informational. We didn't say, listen, you guys can come in here and pick any name that you want, use your best judgment, good luck, come back, discuss it for an hour, have informal meetings out, or come back in a week, and then whatever, nothing. It was like they walked in, time is ticking on that red clock. You have 59, 58, 57. Pick the school, pick the school name, pick the school name. Pick the school. I like Knightsbridge. Everybody said Knightsbridge. Let's go with Knightsbridge, right? It was it was chaotic at best, and it was unfair at worst. And for something that is lasts as long as it does, the name of a school, the community should not be bypassed. They should not be an afterthought. They should be the deciding factor, the discussion, the audience. They should be the ones that come up with this. I know if I had a public school going up in my neighborhood. I would want to have the complete and total opportunity to participate in a meaningful way that is legitimate, not in a way that is rushed, right? We, we have seen a lot of committees come by here where the people are picked to come and just tell us what we already mandated them to say. And I don't believe that that was the situation here. I think that the situation was we tried to rush it, but that's not a good job and it's unfair to the community. So. I would recommend that we go back out and we allow them to have the actual, not changing any of the members, but allow them the time to discuss. One person even said, I would have loved to have researched. I would have loved to have researched. What does it mean? Do we name it after, somebody momentarily said, do we name it after a person? What about this person? And somebody said, well, I'd like to research who she is. I'd like to know more about her before we name a school after her. And so it's unfair that we say, hey, you get here, you walk in the parking lot, and the time is already ticking down, and you have to name this school for the community. It, there's no seriousness there. There's no seriousness, and there's no rush. There's no rush. It took 18 months to build a school, and we have to name it in 50 minutes? 
it's not fair. It's not fair to the community. So I would request that the board, and I will motion, that, the, that we put this back out to the community, allow them to have a substantial amount of time to discuss and research and put their heart and soul into something as important as naming a school for 100 years. I think that's valid. And I think that that's fair for both of these committees, which did a phenomenal job considering the circumstances. Like I said, I sat here. These were thoughtful people. They gave it a good discussion. But even if we asked them, I guarantee you they would say, it's kind of unfair to force us to call this a famous school in one hour. And it is. So um, I'd like to motion that we put this back out. We allow the community to have more time to consider their options, to be able to do research, and to understand what the barriers of naming the schools are, of which they know only one, that you're not allowed to name it what we actually named it without their input. So. Mr. Melendez, you're recognized. Yeah, I'd rather talk about that process in 1701, but for the purposes of this, you know, um, the school is coming online. And so I know I felt like this was rushed already, but we do got to get moving because we got to select the mascot, the colors, everything else like that. But even though I do appreciate what Mr. Arguello had highlighted, and so you know, definitely I want to be able to solidify that, you know, moving forward, what, what that process is. And so um, no, I'm ready to vote on Knight's Point at this point. Second for Knight's Point. We have a motion for uh, Knight's Point by Mr. Melendez, a second by Ms. Castillo. I do have discussion. Mr. Arguello, you recognize? Yeah, I would just, you know, we are rushing the vote, making the vote even faster than the committee had the time to consider a name for it. It just makes no sense. We, how long did it take to build this school? Mr. Sharma, how long did it, this school take to build? It'll be totally 18 months, Mr. Sharma. 18 months, and we're gonna take 60 minutes to name a building that's supposed to last how many years, Mr. Sharma? Uh, minimum of 50, minimum of 50. 50 year decision we're gonna make in 60 minutes is totally unfair to the community. It means that we don't care about you. It means that we don't care about your opinion. And, and that's ridiculous. We spent more time talking about considering a third company which wasn't, which didn't make the, the points system that they have in place than we are naming a school for 50 years. The contract for Delta for, for the dental is only gonna last three years. But this is gonna be a 50 year decision and nobody even wants to consider it or give them time. It's ridiculous, it's not serious. I have a motion by Mr. Melendez, a second by Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. 14.12. Uh, before we move on to that one, 14.11, can we have everyone who was uh, BB stand? I think there's more of you in this room than just a... your time and your efforts been on this. Um, before we get started with CC, can we have that whole team stand up and we'll recognize you now. So anyone here that named CC? Hi, my name is Candace Shields, and um, I also am honored to be part of the naming committee for CC, um, along with my fellow committee members. Um, we did meet once and then decided that we wanted to take time to research, so then we came back two weeks later for a second committee meeting where we all went around the table and brought suggestions um, that we all discussed and gave our reasonings for. Then we went around the table a second time to vote for our top three. And after the tallies were taken of the ones that we all named as our top three, we came out with um, one in the clear lead that we all voted for, which was Voyager. Uh, Voyager was one of the ones listed on the community survey. Um, and we had, you know, so we felt like we had community support from there, but we also liked the, um, just the name itself had greater implications that we all felt um, that we aligned with. Um, the three runners up, so that had seven votes, all seven of the committee members voted for that one. Um, and then the three runners up all had four votes each as a tie, and those names were Split Oak, Sand Hill, and Magnolia Square. So we wanted as a group to present to you the findings with our name that we all had in the lead and then the runners up for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Aguilar? Yeah, so this, again, I same thing, same exact situation, and they actually 
decided that they could go back and let's let's do another meeting again, right? Would, wouldn't you guys have loved to have had the opportunity to do that, right? It's it's clear. Um, so number one, thank you for your service. I appreciate. It. I saw your guys' discussion. I didn't even know that when you guys were going to come back. I would have loved to have gone and observed that one as well. Did you guys know that you guys could have named the school absolutely anything? Uh, we were given instructions. We understood what the rules were um, as of what it couldn't be named, and then we understood that it could be anything else other than those things it couldn't be. Good. So uh, Voyager was already on that list. I'm glad that you guys feel like you guys went through a process, right? Again, this is a 50-year decision, so it would have been great to have you guys from the very beginning trying to decide, right? Like, I mean, the school gets built. Uh, we have 18 months to decide a name. Instead, we try to rush it in two one-hour meetings. Not so sure that that's super appropriate. But I do appreciate the great amount of work and the great discussion that you guys had. Uh, um, another thing to mention, these meetings were at 4 p.m. and at 5 p.m. So I don't know if anybody here has ever driven a car in Osceola County before, but it takes from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. to drive three blocks. So when we put it at 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., what we're doing is preventing people from having the opportunity to come and participate. We're not opening up to the public. So instead of providing them with the opportunity, we're robbing them of the opportunity. And I think it's important to state that. So thank you very much for your service. I do appreciate everything that you've done, and you guys as well. I appreciate it. Thank you, and I, I do appreciate the committee's work. And um, and I like the fact that you guys gave us your top four and didn't just say, here's your number one, because I'm actually split between the top two. You know, because I like the fact that Voyager has that implication of, you know what, we want our students to be able to be self-sufficient to a certain degree. And you gotta go out there and explore the depths of your knowledge. You know, go out there and go beyond your comfort zone in order to get to be the highest potential learner that you can be. So I really like that. But then again, there's something about Split Oak because it's right there next to Split Oak. And that has huge implications. Because you talk about a teaching opportunity, why is my school name Split Oak? Oh, it was a Split Oak Forest. It was a mitigation site. It was by the state of Florida. You know, you can kind of create some environmental I know Mr. Sasset, the principal, was there too, was talking about, you know, doing different, you know, programs to kind of get kids to understand, you know, nature and things like that. Or we have like, um, I think we might have the agricultural program there, right? The agricultural. So, um, each, I'm kind of like, I kind of like both, you know what I mean? So, um, I kind of, kind of would see what the rest motion. of the consensus of the board would be. I don't know which one I want. I <laughs> Make a motion. I'm not, well, I'm curious, but I believe in a, I had to have three votes to do something. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm split between both, but I'm curious to see what the other board members say because I'm willing to go to a different one if somebody else feels more passionate about another name. Mr. Aguayo, you're right. <coughs> yeah, honestly, um, I would, I, I like naming schools after historical figures as opposed to things that are um, um, more abstract in the sense that this uh, the naming of a school is a teaching moment right and it's a teaching moment that lasts for 50 years for a community so i i like that idea but certainly at the very it, to me I, I gotta i gotta point out one group had a meeting for 50 minutes right and then we're rushed to pick a name because another meeting was about to start and that was like the biggest thing the deadline they had that was the countdown clock the other ones got a chance to consider everything took two weeks to think about it, then came back, had a meeting, and now they're proposing the name. So you're gonna say yes to the answer that the people who don't feel like they had the time to consider, and then you're gonna argue with the people who did have time to consider it for two weeks. It makes no sense. So of course, you guys did your job. It's not maybe what I would name a school, but I'm gonna support you. You guys did the job, right? You guys had the time to think about it. So I'm gonna support what the community says. Um, the, I, I think that, Naming a school should be a bigger deal than this. You know, we're, we're, this is kind of a silly discussion. And, and I think that we should basically, this should be something that we take seriously. And our, our community, for sure, these kids are gonna be, what school did you go to for the rest of their lives? What elementary school did you go to? What K-8 did you go to? I went to, you know, AAA, or I went to Kingsbridge. Why Kingsbridge? I wouldn't really name that school. Well, that's the developer. You know, so a whole bunch of rich people got together and they wanted the school named after their development. Oh, well, that's fantastic. 
you know, instead of naming a school after something that's really important, we're going to name a school after, you know, the whims of people who build neighborhoods. So, I mean, I, 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 to be honest, I think it's grotesque. But with that, I will motion to approve the committee's recommendation. Okay. I have a motion by Mr. Arguello, second by Ms. Castillo. Would you like to? Maybe there's no point. They did what we asked them to do. They did their research. They took their time. We asked them to do this not once because there was already input from the community before we asked for the committees. So respect what the people want, which I agree, Voyager. And I agree with both names, by the way. People took time out of their days to be on these committees, so I respect their opinions. So second for Voyager. I have a motion by Mr. Arguello, second by Ms. Castillo, Mr. Mon uh, Mr. Arguello recognized. Yeah, I'm just gonna point out that yes, the community got input. We did, a, we did a survey, but we didn't do it in the way that school board policy dictates. And in fact, we named the school against the policy that we have. Right. So, I mean, just, I mean, you gotta, we gotta start thinking before we say things. We, I mean, put a little bit of thought into what you're saying. We're gonna, we're gonna vote for violating the policy? No, I mean, don't complain Are about us. Are we violating the policy right now? Excuse me, not please, the excuse me. Don't, yes. And I had to force the issue to follow policy. So my point is that instead of forcing these things down the throats of the community, that maybe you have a little bit more respect for them and you do things in a way that are more serious and about service instead of your ego. We have a motion for Voyager, a second. A motion by Mr. Arguello for Voyager, a second by Ms. Castillo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. Um, and 14.13, motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Castillo. Second. Second by Mr. Melendez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? We are now open for public comment. Please remember to state your name and address when approaching the podium and that we do have some rules and regulations regarding um, your public comment. Uh, Tony Rapanese. Oh, the, the committee, if you would like to leave at this time, you're free to go. Uh, the committee's Good evening, um, Tony Rapinesi, 1253 Myrtle Avenue, St. Cloud, um, Supervisor of Social Services. Because it is Social Work Month, I want to give a shout out to the amazing social workers at Student Services, and I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. They are exceptional advocates for our students and families and work tirelessly behind the scenes. As a social worker myself, in the district 25 years, I started when I was 15, by the way, um, 20 of which were as a school social worker, I know we are often remiss in advocating and discussing the incredible, often heartbreaking, and at times rewarding work we do. Many people don't know the many challenges that are faced and how often social workers act as problem solvers, compassionate listeners, and champions for the most vulnerable in our society. As many of you already know, without the basic needs, such as housing, school supplies, food, a safe and structured environment, our students cannot be academically successful. Our families who struggle on a daily basis just to survive, oftentimes, unfortunately, put academics on the back burner. And this is where our social workers come in. School social workers who hold a master's degree in social work, and many also hold a Florida license in clinical social work, receive requests from teachers, administrators, counselors, and other district staff to provide individual and group counseling and to support parents through various hardship. They work to find community resources such as food, shelter, and clothing. They collaborate with DCF and often make calls to the abuse registry for the protection of our children. They conduct threat assessments for self-harm or self to others. They have all received the Florida model training. All of the staff serve on our crisis team and are sent out to schools to support. Unfortunately, when a staff member dies, 
when a student dies, if there is a bus accident, or any emergency that affects the school community. If there is a hurricane, tornado, or whole tail fire, for example, they work diligently to provide emotional support and resources. All are trained in the evidence-based prepare curriculum on how to deal with these crises. Our social workers are also youth mental health first aid trainers and have trained staff continuously throughout the district. Our goal as social workers to alleviate stressors for students and families, provide a safe place to talk for students and parents, build resilience and coping skills while respecting the family's cultures and their background. I'm done, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we find that we, just really quickly, behind every student ID, there's a child or adolescent with a life story. And much of that story is shaped by their school experiences. I would like to invite and meet with each of you or my staff, or please shadow one of my social workers on one of our school days. Um, I want to thank you all too for your service to our community. Thank you. Good evening, board members and Dr. Shannon. I have here in front of me, well, my name is Laura McAdams. I live at 4654 Hickory Tree Lane, St. Cloud, Florida. Um, I, this is something I do have some expertise in. I have a lot of experience, nine years in real estate. So I went over some of the paperwork for the development over there by Lakeview Elementary. Um, both of these are LOIs. So neither one of them is like official contracts because it states in here clearly in both contracts that at any point in time they could cancel the contract because it's not really an actual contract for them to purchase the land. But um, Starlight didn't, pres I believe it was Starlight. I thought it was Ashton Woods when it was presented last time. But Starlight doesn't have proof of funds because they're a bigger builder and they decided not to present those. But Diamond has the proof of funds that they have for their $2 million offer. But according to our um, code of ethics in real estate, we're supposed to present proof of funds for both contracts. So there's two LOIs involved, two builders and two developers involved. So you should get the same paperwork across the board for both builders. So there's no exceptions because one says they have more money than the other you need to present proof of funds. So the other one's 3.4 million, and there's no proof of funds for them. Now I looked at both developments, and obviously one is better than the other, but at the end of the day, I noticed also I was able to pull all the, I'm able to pull all the land that the school district owns and the city of St. Cloud owns, so I have access to all that, and I, I believe a lot of people in here do because it's public record. So, I mean, I don't understand why we can't sell another piece of land that's not already surrounded by tons of residential homes with limited road access and one-way streets all over the place and with the school of this size and the amount of students in it it just doesn't make sense to put residential development in a place like this and then at one one only has the bigger developer only wants to put one extra access road which is starlight and then diamond at least they're smaller and want to provide a little bit of space for more school building, parking, and stacking. And they're providing two access roads out of the smaller community. So you would think as a school board, you would notice some of these things, but I know that sometimes it's just about the money, but you have to think about the community, the children that are walking up and down those streets. I mean, I drive it and hardly because there's so much, so much traffic there. And it's a disaster just the way it is now. So I can only imagine adding another 100 units or 175 units for the other one would do to that little space right there off of Columbia and Fifth Street. It's just not a smart decision at all for the community. And I don't know how many of the community members are actually aware of this, but it would be really good to keep it on hold and maybe allow the community to speak out about it a little bit longer. So that's all I gotta say. Thank you, Thanks. Andrew Moon. Greetings, uh, school board members of the school district of Osceola County. 
Uh, my name is Andrew Moon. Uh, address 777 North Orange Avenue, Atlanta, Florida 32801. I'm the principal of Osceola Science Charter School. And uh, I thank you all for uh, everything that you do for the children, the families, and the community. And I look forward to uh, fulfilling the privilege of supporting them as well as uh, not just a K through eight school, but now as a K through 12. So thank you all so much for everything you do and for allowing us to take part as well. Thank you. Thank you. Emily Abbott. <coughs> Hi, good evening. My name is Emily Abbott, 1473 Pine Marsh Loop, St. Cloud. I am here on behalf, and first thank you for the forum to speak. I'm here on behalf of the Tope Claggett Band Boosters. I am the president of the Band Boosters. And if you're familiar with our Tope Claggett Band program, we have made tremendous strides in the six years the school has been open. And we are now performing at one of the highest levels of the state um, for competition. We have the opportunity to have a performance at Disney on a weekend in May, and we have been denied that opportunity to have a field trip in May. And there is no policy that field trips cannot be scheduled in May. This is a weekend performance that doesn't involve instruction or testing, which I know that we wouldn't ever want to take our students away from testing, but I would just like consideration for either to be a standardized policy on field trips in May or consideration for the band to be allowed to perform at Disney on a weekend. Thank you. We, we can follow up on this. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Do we'll, we you have your, your information? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. You're welcome. Angel Kova. Hello, everyone. My name is Angel Lewis Kova. I live in 2004 Fountain Boulevard in Kissimmee, Florida. Um, <clears throat> I'm addressing everyone here today on the basis of safety and security. A couple of days ago, OHS was given a tip that a student had marijuana in their bag and found a loaded gun during a search. This was the second incident this year, and to my acknowledgement, many parents of our community fear that their children aren't safe and secured in our schools. Many suggested to put in metal detectors. Many suggested to put in more law enforcement, and many suggested homeschooling. <clears throat> I ask every leader here today, across the county of Osceola and the state of Florida, when will we prioritize safety and security to its full extent? When will we give parents a peace of mind and calmness? Let's implement safer measures that'll prevent what we all don't want to happen. We owe it to the children. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Tavares. Yes, my name is Julia Tavares, 520 Hunter Circle, Kissimmee, Florida. Okay, so several weeks ago, um, I attended a board meeting where the American Library Association was the topic of the conversation. I was confused as to why this was a hot issue as it was heavily debated by one of the board members. Afterwards, I decided to do a quick Google search, only to discover that although at first it appeared innocent, there was nothing innocent about this organization. It doesn't take much effort to realize why many parents, including myself, would never want this organization in charge of deciding or recommending that books um, for students would uh, have access to much less that are paid for by our um, tax payer dollars. When the leader of an organization probably describes herself as a um, lesbian Marxist, it states that this is the lens from which she will lead her organization. And it generates a true cause for concern. Why would we even entertain someone with such a blatantly political move? <coughs> Over the last few years, the state has stepped in and prevented the kind of abuses that the president of the ALA seems inclined to perpetuate. So then why would we send our chief librarian to this organization? Is that the district? <coughs> Is it that the district is defiant of state law, or is it that this chief librarian is defiant of the school district's adherence to state law? 
I wanted to speak on this issue because I wanted the school district to know that citizens like myself watch these meetings. For us, it is very clear what is going on. I know that you try to act like everything is good, but we can see hidden ulterior motives and agendas. I think the reason that I'm here and we're all beginning to understand that we can trust that we cannot trust the district just to do what is right on their own. They require diligence of the community to ensure that they are represented properly. I want to encourage the school board to make values a standard again for our community and generations to come. We are on to attorney report and legal issues. Ms. Corin? I have no report this evening. Thank you. We are now on to new business 17.01, school names and committees. Mr. Arroyo, you're recognized. Yes, yeah, so a, a lot of what I said earlier is essentially what I want to address in this day. I think that we should have a normalized process that does not include a 60 minute meeting. Um, during the high traffic hour where people don't feel like they can really come up with a fair, um, uh, where they have a fair space to come up with a name for us. So I'd like, to, I'd like to see some kind of formalized process at the very earliest stages of the school being built, right? Like we don't build schools just out of nowhere. We know that this is gonna be an, an important thing. We know that the school is gonna have to be named we certainly don't have to rush it. Not the signs, not the mascot. All of those things are silly compared to the naming of the school. The naming, you, you know, you don't put the cart before the horse. Of course, we did that this evening. But why don't we formalize a process? That's what it is. So, um, Superintendent, I don't know if you would want to recommend something or you want me to bring something back to the board that is formal or what. And what we had today, I hope, never happens again. I can address the comment. Um, staff follows the, the policy as written, and um, and we were clarified on the policy as written, which is why we wanted to commence the committees. I have uh, no concerns um, enhancing any policy uh, for the betterment of greater transparency, more time, greater consideration, community involvement. Um, and I believe that we will be specifically addressing this policy at a workshop coming up where I am looking forward to in, in ingesting all of the feedback from the board members in the name of bringing back a policy revision that would be um, that would be much more clear um, and representative of what the board members would like from the process. Thank you, Mr. Melendez, you're recognized. Thank you. One thing I would like to see though, Dr. Shinoff, is somebody do a little research on how we did it before. Because I know there was a process before. You know, I mean, that was before you were superintendent. Like, where well, we used to have a workshop and things like that. So, like, sometimes, like, why reinvent the wheel when we can look past how we did it before? No. So this, I got a second point, but I'll let you get finished. This policy has been in place since 2007. So if if there was a workshop in place um, regarding school naming, that didn't follow policy. So that might be a practice, but that's yeah, not part of the policy. Yeah. I I believe very strongly that the policy should reflect the practice. Um, you know, we, we have had schools named since 2007 that have been named after subdivisions, many. So I, I can't say that the policy has been, has been followed. I think that that has been raised by many board members, um, most recently by board member Arguello. I think it's important for us to get some clarity so that moving forward, staff can operationalize um, the policy as written and we can make sure that there's no ambiguity moving forward correct so at least my recommendation of a template 
is that we look back and say, okay, what is a good appropriate timeline? So let's say, um, so whatever policy we say, we like to say uh, maybe, I'm just making it up, like six months prior to the school opening, we initiate the process. Now if we need nine months, that's a different story, I don't know. I'm just saying that we should have like maybe an initial workshop where it's not voted on, and in that initial workshop, we establish maybe the survey questions, we establish the committee members that we want to appoint, you know, and then we have the committee get together. And I do like the fact that the committee, they did it on their own, but I like that concept of two meetings, where the committee has like an initial meeting where they get told the rules and regulations, what you cannot do and this and that, and let them sit on it. You're right, because that's a good point. You know, you don't want to have somebody, even if it's a five hour meeting, the first time somebody meets together, you want them to kind of go back there and maybe talk to their neighbors. You know, and then have a follow-up meeting where that committee then kind of comes up with the final decision and then come back to the board for a recommendation. So thank you for that, for those suggestions. I think that those are great suggestions and, and I think that um, I look forward to the board considering that and, and, and other suggestions. I, I think that it's important to, to recognize that we really can't initiate the process before the zoning process is complete before we establish attendance boundaries for a school, that should start the clock. And so maybe from that point, we begin the process once we have those attendance zones established. So if, if the construction begins 18 months out, but the zoning isn't done until 12 months out, then let's go ahead and start the clock at that 12, that, at the 12 months out. And certainly, I, I'm, I'm looking, listen, I am looking forward to getting better clarity, a better process in place, and I think that anytime we can see um, opportunities for policy improvement, um, it's there. I, I own how this process went down. I own it 100%. Um, and so I, I also feel very compelled to work very closely with, with all of you to make sure that the policy is very clear moving forward. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited for what we can do together uh, to make sure that this process is much cleaner and transparent moving forward. Mr. Arguello, you recognized? Yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear it. I know that you're you know, you're, that's, those are honest and genuine intentions. I don't doubt that for a second. Um, but to be clear, we did not follow the policy. So we can't say that we follow the policy and then not follow the policy and then follow the policy afterwards. You know, in the end, we didn't do that. Which, it's not like it happens all the time, right? It's not like something that's so common that we, sh we know it's every three weeks we're naming a school, right? But. I think that we even need to review the schools that have been named after neighborhoods and rename them in accordance with our policy. Because there's, there's, um, it's an opportunity lost. So it, it's, I, I, everyone likes to be a stickler for the policy when the policy is one that they support or when it benefits them, right? So when do we follow the policy? When do we not follow the policy? In this case, the policy is pretty clear, we just didn't follow it. Right? I mean, it's not like the policy was um, confusing or anything. They, in, in, in fact, within five minutes, they knew that we had not followed the policy when we named the schools, right? Both of those committees. So I think that we need to follow that policy. We also need to not be um, hypocritical when we're following, not, not certainly not you, I'm not saying that you, Dr. Shinoff, I'm just saying that as a district, we should not be hypocritical when we're following policies. So I, I, I would like to revisit the renaming of the schools that were named out without um, guidance or adherence to the policy. I have to say I have no appetite for that because that's going back and I mean, that means our names for the schools that we put forward could change at some point in time because some board later on says, I'm gonna change the policy and now we're gonna name schools by That's these right. characteristics. We broke the rules, that's so, not what it means. That's exactly the opposite of what it means, right? Like, we we violated our own rules. I don't think we intentionally violated doesn't our doesn't matter, rules. No, intention is not a standard that, you know, like, we break the rules all the time. Whether you, we, <coughs> we adhere to an oath of office. So it's not about your intention of, well, well, I, 
Yeah, yeah, you did. We did because we all knew that, and then we argued about it. Mr. Melendez, you're right. Yeah, I have an appetite as well, but I do have an appetite for modifying the policy moving yes. forward with, with timelines and, and, and clarity, and I also wouldn't mind adding a mascot and colors to that process, sure. so that way there's 100% clarity too. So when we say we voted on something, the end goal, the deliverable, should be the name of the school, the mascot, and the colors. That way there's no ambiguity. The contractor can buy the paint and do what they got to do, and not have to have a follow-up meeting later on to finalize that process. Thank you. Mr. Arguello? FYI, that would be against the policy because the the mascot and the colors are decided by the principal. Well, I mean, we're going to be creating a policy. Creating right, a I'm policy. just saying that would be against the policy. Here's the thing. Yes. Familiarize yes. yourselves with what policy. <laughs> Familiarize yourself with the policy. That's, you know, I mean, it, we got into our homework, right? I mean, start doing your homework. We are on to 17.2 methods of addressing bullying. Mr. Arguello, you're recognized. So there was a very tragic case, which I'm not going to get into the details, but a very tragic case recently, uh, an extremely complex case of bullying, very multidimensional. So and, and, and some bull essentially bullying took place in one of our schools, outside of our one of our schools, uh, around our schools, in between home and our schools, a very severe case with very severe repercussions. The parents of the child that was bullied had a you know in caring for their child they had that they had to react and they reacted perfectly normal to the process the district was hamstrung by a lack of opportunity or lack of ability to deal with the bullying that was happening in between <coughs> home and the school so people had to watch essentially a child be victimized by somebody who was bullying them physically violently and there was nothing that we could do about it. That child, the child who was the perpetrating the bullying, was also in a very complex situation. They were overwhelmed and their parents were overwhelmed with tragedy. This was not a child just asking for help in its, by their actions. This was a child screaming, begging for help by their action. And there was nothing that we could do. This is a huge gap. We talk about, someone else just came and talked about school safety. This is a far more common act than a weapon on campus. This is a far more uh, um, pressing issue than any parent realizes. This is something that we really need to do. Now, I've had many conversations about this issue. It's not something that necessarily we can resolve as a school district because of legislation. But I would like to gauge the districts, uh, the board members, uh, appetite and hopefully they have an appetite for this is submitting a request for the legislation to consider expanding the bounds where the school can react to bullying all the way from home so that if they're at the bus stop then we can act on that issue if they're in some place if they're walking home from school to their home then that corridor would be considered an act where we could take action of discipline towards a child who's being victimized because without that, these kids, those are the places where it happens. It doesn't necessarily happen in the school or in a classroom. It doesn't necessarily happen at recess. It happens when we can not we can watch, but we can't do anything. So I would like to um, propose that we make a request to legislation for the next legislative cycle to address that gap. Thank you, Mr. Aguayo. Mr. Willis, you're recognized. I'm, I'm glad you said what you said at the end because we had issues before at St. Cloud Middle School where students were going to the gas station and getting bullied there. Um, and the statute is clear that if it's outside the parameters, we, have, we don't have jurisdiction. And I even called the DOE, the state, you know, at the state level, and they mentioned that. So the only thing you could do is report it to the police. You know, so then becomes the issue where if you want to absorb it, do we also absorb the liability? You know what I mean? So if something happens, so I'm careful of absorbing liability outside of the district. Now, what I would be considering, Mr. Arguello, because I, again, I had this conversation, is if we know student A is bullying student B, and they're both students at the school district, even though the incident happened outside the school, is there nothing stopping us 
even right now as law is written for the principal to have like a no contact contract within them or to kind of have that discussion with them hey don't do this you know even though we cannot punish them specific, we could technically punish them outside of school through the expulsion process if they actually get arrested but if they don't get arrested you know and i guess this question is for legal right now what are the um possible if the both students i'm not talking about student a is a student student b is some random community member but two students go to the same school, what, what how abilities does the principal have? So in general, um, the school district has jurisdiction for discipline when it comes to things that are on campus, with two exceptions. Um, those exceptions are if someone makes a threat to the school, and if they make that threat while well, they're off property, but it creates an impact on the school campus, then we can take the school board can take jurisdiction over that. The other thing is under 1006147 of Florida statutes, it specifically states that when students are being cyber bullied off campus, so um, if two people are bullying each other over social media off campus, and that bullying has a substantial impact on campus. So, and this is a bad hypothetical, but you know, if you and I were talking smack against each other because of that, I was having an issue at school, then the school district can take jurisdiction <coughs> over that bullying. So if we were to fight off campus, the school district cannot take jurisdiction over the fight, but the school district can take jurisdiction over the bullying. And in fact, bullying and harassment are both the highest level of assessor offenses for discipline, and a student can be referred for expulsion based on cyberbullying off campus if it has that great of an impact to a student on campus. But, but now, okay, man, Mr. Boy opened up a can of worms, because now here's an issue, and this is a good discussion, because the definition of bullying, and I sit down with Dr. Allen and his safety committee, that becomes a conundrum. Bullying has to be the repeated That's um, offense. So if the first fight happens off campus, now that's not even, can we at least document it? Maybe we don't jurisdiction it, because now it's no, because if the first time they fight, it's a second fight. You know what I'm trying to say? In, in, in real life terms, it's a second fight. So it's bullying but the first or fight harassment. So the district can take jurisdiction of cyber bullying or cyber harassment if it's something that happens off campus and on campus. So under assessor, harassment is one instance, bullying is repeated. So if a student was to threaten another student through social media on Tuesday, and because of that on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, they are that scared, that is something that the district could potentially take jurisdiction But then to Mr. Arvaro's point, then there goes the amendment to the law. Because you know, even though we don't have jurisdiction to punish them, but it still should be a documented incident if student A and student B get into a physical altercation outside of campus, even though it doesn't meet the cyberbullying, because to me that truly is an incident between two students. So the first time they fight in campus is technically the second time they fought because we never counted it, and it's now this the first time that it happens in school, it's not bullying because it doesn't meet the state definition. But in reality, they did have an altercation. So I, I'm actually seeing the intent behind Mr. Arguello's point is that even though we may not be able to punish him for that first incident of fighting outside of campus, we still need to be able to document it as an incident that literally occurred between two students at the school. So if it does happen again at the school, it's not the first time officially on school grounds, it's technically the second fight, therefore qualifying for the definition of bullying. There you go. Ms. Castillo, you're next. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to have further discussions about adding this to our legislative priorities for next year. Um, so it sounds like most of us would be okay and on board with that. Mr. Recorder, you recognized? Yeah. Uh, um, so I think that it's basically a, it, it's a shame that threats to the campus can count and we can basically take disciplinary action, but a threat to a student, we cannot, right? And it just, it's a prioritization issue. So if, if there are threats being made to a student, now cyber bullying there are, right? That counts, that's so it, that counts, right? So a threat would also count. So right. if someone through electronic means threatens another student and because of that the student is scared to come to school, right. that would also count. Absolutely, but what I'm saying is if somebody threatened the campus that off that they called and they said bomb threat, gun, whatever, that counts, right? But if they called the student and they were like, Hey, I'm gonna kick your butt. Then, all, you know, that's that's outside of our reach, right? Unless it's so. My 
In this case, there was a no contact cr contract and there was already documented cyberbullying. This is an extreme case, but there, it doesn't, it, the only reason it got extreme was because the district, not to say it's a fault of the district, but because of the lapses and the com complicated processes that, and, and laws surrounding, surrounding uh, the situation, we had to watch this child get brutalized multiple times. So that's happening throughout the state. So I'd like to recommend, I'm the, I'm the right of piece of legislation. I would love to, uh, I would love for the district to support us sending it up there as a legislative priority to reduce this gap. It would improve the lives of our students. It would improve the, the opportunity for our students to concentrate on their academics. And it would protect people, right, who are screaming for help and it would allow us to get involved in their lives before they end up getting arrested and going to jail or causing irreparable harm to someone else. So in, in all respects, I think it's a, it's a gap that should have been seen by the legislature already, but it has not, and I, I, I think that it's very much needed. Um, I think we have consensus on this. Okay. Yeah. 17.03 uh, ALA conference. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the librarian actually, um, that was pulled, the, 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 she did not go. However, in this, what I would like to do is discuss severing our relationship with the ALA. Bay, Citrus, Hernando, Collier County, Lee, Sarasota, Pasco, Santa Rosa, Lake, St. Lucie, Escambia, Manatee, Charlotte, Flagler, Hillsborough and the very best, highest performing district in the entire state, St. John's, have all severed their relationship with the ALA based on their radical agenda of grooming students. In fact, the ALA and the president of the LA, which was mentioned earlier during public comments, herself mentioned that libraries must be a site of socialist programming. Uh, even more dangerous than that, however. That's ridiculous in itself that we would have any relationship at all with this organization. But then, uh, even more dangerous is their overt sexualization of children through their uh, programming, libra library programming. Uh, they, they promote banned books contrary to our Florida state law. So, of course, banned books is a term that everybody uses now loosely but they essentially are promoting books which state law has already banned from Florida. So I think that it's time that we sever our relationship. We add our names to the list, uh, uh, to Osceola adds their name to the list of counties. By the way, all counties which are outperforming Osceola County, right? So there's a reason that counties perform better than Osceola does. I think this is one, this is a distraction and this goes along hand in hand with bullying because we basically have adults who are basically forcing uh, a, a view and a behavior on children that is absolutely inappropriate. And so I'd like to motion to sever our relationship with the ALA. then need to put it on the agenda for a vote at the next meeting. So um, new business would be a time where you would discuss what you want to bring to a future board meeting. So we can be voted on at the next board meeting to start by out. Do we have to have consensus to want to put this on the next agenda? Yes, you would need to. No, I, it, let me just think that through for a minute. So you have to get you have to get approval from other board members before you place something on the, in the agenda. Past, of course with not. New business items, we've done that. So I'm just questioning. In the past, we violated our policies, rules, and procedures, and the office rules. Corinne, I had a question. No, I got a yeah, call and return question. I'm sorry, you got. A, I don't know if we wanted to. Wanted. Is there a motion to approve the recognition? If a part of time question, it, to me, it's like in order to place something on the agenda. He had to have submitted it eight days prior and had to get posted publicly. So he did that. Now, I'm going to vote against it, but.
but the point is, I still believe in that process. I think that he should be allowed to vote. It's been, it's a, it's a published agenda, and it's on new business. Why does it have to like wait to the next meeting to get voted on? Because it's not action. It's under new business. There's no action items here. I mean, I don't care. I'm just saying that's why it's not. It does need to be posted. Oh, as because an just because it's so, yeah, because I see what you're saying. Because I'm just trying to understand it logically. Because just because the item is listed on the agenda as new business, there's no documents there's no source there's nothing to vote on there's nothing of substance so if he just brings it up now we have to have an opportunity to look at it review it and actually have something to vote on that is correct so okay. under type it's discussion not action gotcha that's fine. okay i'm that's fair <coughs> but so, at so my point, question is the board would need to vote they wanted to determine if they want to bring it as an action item for the next full board meeting i mean that's that's we've never done that we have done that. Have. We've never done that. We've we never, have. not once. We have taken a consensus vote. We've never voted on whether we're going to bring something back and put it on the agenda before, unless it was an agenda item already that we were voting on. So, technically, anybody can make a motion if it's new business that's on there. However, if you'd like to make your motion, go ahead. But I'm, I'm fine putting it on the agenda for the next meeting. And there's, you do not need consensus to put something on the agenda. I'm happy to do that research and get back to all of you if you would like. That would basically mean that we're voting before we have to vote. Uh, I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, that's the confusing part. Yeah, the, like, it, should, it, should have, it should not have to vote to put it on the agenda. It should be able to put it on the agenda on its own. Mr. Gwit, or Ms. Castillo, you're recognized. Thank you, Tim. For the purposes of just understanding the process, to be clear, I whatever the board decides to do today is fine. I'm just letting you know as someone who sat in that chair for two years I went through board training under new business the discussion is in fact whether or not well, it could be anything but in this particular case we are asking whether or not we have an appetite to vote on this item yeah. that is what the discussion is that is the way that we have in fact always done it and that is the way in fact that I was trained case. that's fine you can disagree on that point um, I'm just clarifying for some of the folks who have questions on the process the way that we have done it I'm not saying that you know there, there may be a different process but that is the way that we have done it and that is the way that I was trained when I was chair so then we would essentially first of all we very rarely have new business items so how does something get on the agenda then how many new agenda how many new business items have we had over the past three years that I've been here every three or four meetings we may have one maybe but we still have an agenda every two weeks we have an agenda so you're saying that the finance office can put something on the agenda somebody in it uh, dr. Clayton can put something on the agenda the superintendent can put on the agenda but the person representing his district can't put something on the agenda listen to the absurdity that you guys are speaking then you are here specifically to put things on the agenda and vote on them. For you to say that we need consensus to do that would mean that you're voting without voting in advance of having to vote. Think about what you're saying. So I don't know what training you got, but I would go for a refresher course immediately. I'm going to ask you to refrain from insults. I was simply telling you I'm what the process has been. I'm telling you to listen to what and you guys are saying. And in fact, I recall that you specifically did this process to add something to the agenda and it was added in this exact manner. No, you remember things. You remember things when it benefits you that's and the don't difference remember between things you and when I it does that not. I remember things. Thank you. Um, Ms. Corin, can you clarify, can we vote on this if you make the motion now? You can make a motion. No, I apologize. You can vote to put it on the agenda right now. I am also letting you know that it is my under my practice has always been that if there's new business, then the board would vote to decide if they want to have an appetite for the discussion. Great. However, I am more than willing to do additional research on the matter and provide you that clarification tomorrow. So another option could be to bring this back for new business in two weeks, and I can provide you that answer as well. Yes, yeah, so from now on, I better not see anything on the agenda from any single person unless we vote on it in advance, silently by nodding our heads by consensus. 
Is that fair, Dr. Shanoff? Since I can't put anything on the agenda, then the entire district is immobilized at this point. And from now on, we're going to have to nod our head and say, "Are you? Do you agree to put this on the agenda? On the agenda? Oh yeah, I agree to put this on the agenda." It just think about the practice that you're instituting. All due respect, Madam Attorney, it's not about what your practice is. We, if we're going to follow Robert's rules, then we should follow Robert's rules, right? It doesn't change for the district because we have a bunch of people that don't know what Robert's rules are. If they are what they are. And if you go to any, here's, and just to make it very clear for you what the process is, somebody submits the new agenda item, they put it on the, the, as long as it's in time, they put it on the agenda, and then you can either vote on it at that point in time, or you cannot. If you're gonna submit something, which there's no documentation here, I can put it on, or you guys can not, and I can put it on again on the next agenda because there's been no votes. I can put it on for five agendas from now. Every single week, I can put something on the new business. Now, the, this district, what it has done is disqualified things in the past prematurely, intentionally. So I'll say, well, I'd like to do this. And then we would sometimes take a vote on it. But never has it been like, oh, well, Melendez wants to put something on the agenda, but you have to come to the district, to the school board meeting, and then ask for us, for our permission to put something on the agenda. We've never done that. And you're saying that we did that the entire time that you've been here? No. Things have been messed up since you've been here, but not like that to that degree. Mr. Melendez, did you have your light on report? Did you close it? Yeah, I, I'm just doing some, I need to do a little bit more research because, you know, I've been on the board before, and I think you're right, because technically we, we put things on the agenda, but we're talking about new business. What if we don't want to put it on new business? What if we want to put it on the agenda itself to get voted on? When I was on the board back in the day, new business was like open forum. Like when we do public comments, public comes in and speaks, new business is supposed to be truly random. You know what? Hey, at the end of the board meeting, the board members want to discuss things. And since it was never published on the agenda, we brought that item up during new business and said, hey, we're bringing it up for the very first time. <coughs> Therefore, it's never been published. We're not going to vote on it. It's going to go to the next time. But since we created a policy that says we can't even put something on agenda eight days prior, not everybody had an opportunity to look at it and to actually vote on it. So I'm kind of conflicted. So um, to me, new business, the way I understood it was when I was first elected back in 2008, new business was an open forum. You know what I mean? People, would, the board members would go at the very end of the meeting, okay, does anybody have anything to discuss? And then, then Mr. Arguello would raise his hand. It was never on the agenda. It was an open item. And he goes, you know what? I want to talk about naming schools. Okay, great. You just talked about naming schools, but we're going to place it on the next agenda because it was never formally codified ahead. But we have a school board policy that says he's not even allowed to place something on Gentiles eight days prior. So now everyone's notified. So I did state that I would do the research at the next meeting. However, I did just pull up my Robert's Rules of Order right now. And um, the vote to discuss it would be if you wanted to put it as an agenda item for today. Um, a board exactly. member can recommend an agenda item for a future meeting and it would go on the agenda. Gotcha. Do you have a motion, Mr. No, I'm going to put it on the next agenda. Okay. Um, at this time, we do have a uh, mention of concurrency workshop that will now be held Tuesday, April 23rd at 3 p.m. I think we are doing school naming during that time as well. And with that, our